Washington and has ranked among the top five states with the highest rates of suicide for the past four decades. And whereas since 2015, Missoula County has suffered 135 suicides, and whereas suicide by far, firearm accounts for 51% of all suicides in the U.S. and 75% of all suicides in Missoula, and guns stored in the home are used for suicide 40 times more often than for self-defense. And whereas it is estimated that more than 5 million people in the U.S. are survivors of suicide, those who have lost loved ones to suicide. And in Montana, there are over 1,700 new survivors each year. And whereas our community should support suicide prevention efforts to the maximum extent possible with initiatives like Project Tomorrow Montana, which works to reduce Missoula County suicide deaths and attempts through educational programs and evidence-based policy. Now, therefore, in coordination with the National Suicide Prevention Week, we, the Board of County Commissioners in the state of Montana, do hereby recognize the week of September 6th through 14th, 2019, as Suicide Prevention Week. I'm sorry, Board of County Commissioners of Missoula County in the state of Montana. Do hereby recognize the week of September 6th through 14th, 2019, as Suicide Prevention Week. Thank you. And I'd just like to draw folks' attention. There is a list of um, uh, various gatherings that will be happening in Missoula during Suicide Prevention Week. And that can be found uh, on the Project Tomorrow Montana website at projecttomorrow.org. Super important topic for uh, Missoula, Missoula County, and the state of Montana. Uh, does anyone have any comment on Suicide Prevention Week or the proclamation? Okay. Seeing none, is there any public comment on items not on today's agenda? So this is your chance to comment on anything that is not otherwise uh, listed as an agenda topic today. Seeing none, our current claims list, and this would be claims received by the commissioner's office from August 23rd through August 28th, totals $2,189,331.80. And just as a reminder, if folks are interested in, in what that amount uh, really covers, you can go to the electronic version of the agenda for today, drill down and see what all the expenditures were or claims were that add up to that uh, figure. A few housekeeping items. Uh, if you have not done so already coming into the room, please sign in as you exit. That really helps us know how to spell people's names in the public record if you come up to testify and uh, knowing who is here. Uh, if you have a cell phone, please silence it or put it to vibrate or some mode that will not uh, audibly disturb the meeting. And please do try to be as succinct as possible in your comments and keep your comments to three minutes or less. If you come up to the microphone, there is a button on the base of the mic which will turn it from red to green. And please state your name for the record. So we have five public hearings today. The first is a um, continuation of a public hearing on Pine Drive uh, Road up in Sealy Lake. Uh, we will begin with a recap um, a staff report by Steve Nide. Are you going to bring us up to speed on this? I'll turn the microphone on and hand it over to Jean. <laughs> okay. Ms. Curtis. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jean Curtis, for the record. Um, so I was able to get the um, appraisal early, but I, um, I think we need to wait a little bit. So you've heard that the, uh, the petition, the reason for the right of way, why it's a benefit to the public, the historic use of the lot as access for the folks that live around there, and um, several reasons that the right-of-way is needed. The viewer's report suggested waiting for the appraisal. It came in yesterday. It came in much higher than the district had hoped, and we haven't had time to sit down and do a counteroffer. I've talked with um, Rosa, Rosemary Harrison, who is representing uh, the group that own it, but we haven't had time to work it out. Um, at, at this point, we know that the owners really do not object. The neighbors who joined us at the viewing do not object. The one objection you did receive was um, just claimed it was not needed because the sewer project was not going to happen. That was from Mr. Dick Lewis, who owns the lot marked DE409 on your packet. 
which the interesting thing is, is that lot has absolutely no access, um, legal or physical, without this petition for public right-of-way, other than historic use. Um, so the appraisal is com complete, but, and I know you don't have any other public meetings in January or in September. I've lost a whole month of few, apparently. Um, so I, um, I think that if you add it um, to your agenda to be completed and hopefully the decision made at your first meeting in October, that will give us time to negotiate and also time for the sewer district to agree to whatever we come up with. So the there, there's a dollar value, but of course there can be an exchange of value for like sewer connections and things. So we'll need time to work that out. Okay, thank you. So what day would that be? So, I mean, would that be October 3rd? October okay. 3rd. Will that work? That will work. Okay. And without objection from the commission, we will schedule that for October 3rd. Since is it, it is a public hearing that is open still, is there any public comment on the Pine Drive uh, Road petition? Okay. We will go ahead and keep the public hearing open and uh, reconvene on this matter on October 3rd. Thank you. Okay, our second public hearing, which I will open, is on annexation petitions into Missoula Rural Fire District. We'll begin with a staff report by Sam Scott. Sam Scott with the Quirk and Recorder. Um, a petition to annex land into the Missoula Rural Fire District has been submitted to our office. The property to be annexed is legally described as Tract 4 of COS 6042, located in Section 7, Township 11 North, Range 19 West. The physical address of the property is 15747 Fighting Irish Lane in Florence, Montana, 59833. The petition was signed by property owners representing more than 40% of the acreage and 40% of the taxable value of the property to be annexed, and a notice of hearing was published twice in the Missoulian. And we are presenting the petition for your decision. Okay, this is a public hearing. Any public comment on the uh, petition for annexation into Missoula Rural Fire District? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Questions from the commission or comments or a motion? Commissioner Slotnick. Anybody here to speak for the Rural Fire District? It does not look like it. Uh, did, uh, they included their letter of, um, of support. Acceptance. Yeah. So Missoula Rural is supportive on the record. Uh, we get any comment in the other direction? I didn't see anything over email. Looks, looks like a no. No, we just got the petition with the acceptance from the fire district and the signatures of the landowners themselves, and that's the only comment we've received. All right. Okay. It looks like uh, no opposition to this. So, uh, <clears throat> Emmy, uh, would it be helpful if... Uh, as part of the motion, the full motion is read into the record. Is that what you'd prefer? Okay. And I'm sorry. I, just so I understand this, the so this this one portion is annexed, and then all around it is not. Um, Correct. Yeah, it's just the parcel that's highlighted in blue that will be annexed into. It's the little world. annexed island. Okay. All right. Um, I would move that. We approve the petition received by the clerk and recorder's office for parcels of land located in Missoula County to be annexed into the Missoula Rural Fire District. Second. Any further discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thanks, Sam. It's unanimous. I'll go ahead and open a public hearing on Ponderosa Heights, Lot 4, Platt Amendment, and we'll begin with a staff report by Jamie Erbacher. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so this request is coming from Paul Rosignol. Uh, he is the developer of Ponderosa Heights as well as the owner of this lot currently. Uh, he is unfortunately out of town today, but Grant with Selway Builders is here representing him. Um, so Ponderosa Heights is located in Lolo, just west of uh, the intersection of Ridgeway and Highway 93 South. Uh, access to Lot 4 is off of Coulter Pine Street. Uh, Ponderosa Heights was originally platted 
in uh, 2005 with an approximate no-build zone on that lot. Uh, that no-build zone was for slopes that were over 25 percent um, slope. And uh, at that time, the, um, uh, that was based off the 2000 LIDAR. And so accurate, but not completely accurate, uh, definitely approximate. Uh, and so uh, we brought this before you on July 30th of 2019 at an admin meeting to appeal um, the process uh, regarding amending a, a plat, and um, at that time, you granted uh, conditional approval of the appeal. Um, uh, normally, the subdivision regulations would require that a plat modification or amendment go before the planning board, um, and then uh, also adjacent property owner notification within 300 feet and agency notification. So on the 30th, uh, the commissioners um, said that the um, uh, planning board hearing was more or less in excess, uh, but still required the agency notification and adjacent property owner notification. Uh, so we did go out for notification. We did not receive any comments um, for or opposed. Um, at that time in July, the applicant had presented the uh, drawing on the screen that depicted the existing no-build zone as well as what he thought that the uh, actual no-build zones would be. Here was a proposed house location. Um, <clears throat> staff is recommending approval of the modification of the plat. Uh, one of the conditions that we were going to be recommending is that they uh, retain the services of a professional land surveyor or engineer to prepare an exhibit. Um, knowing that that condition was going to be part of our recommendation, um, Paul are, has already hired Territorial Land Works and they have performed that survey. And that information is um, shown on the screen and also attachment B in the staff report. So based on that, we are recommending approval subject to attachment B. Thank you. Would the applicant's rep uh, like to make any comments? Don't feel like you have to, but... I don't know if I could do anything better than that. Okay. <laughs> Tough act to follow. All right. Uh, yeah, my guess is it may not be a nail biter, but you never know. So uh, this is a public hearing. Is there any public comment on uh, this particular item? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Questions uh, or a motion from the commission? Um, I'll move that the request to modify the no-build zone on lot 4 of Ponderosa Heights Phase 2A be approved subject to the exhibit prepared and stamped by licensed surveyor and included as attachment B. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Our fourth public hearing pertains to Rural Special Improvement District 282. Uh, which pertains to Lindbergh Lake Bridge maintenance. And we will open with a staff report by uh, Deputy County Attorney John Hart. And I think John will be followed by maybe some comments or information from uh, Sam Scott from the uh, Clerk and Recorder's Office. John. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, you may recall that at an administrative meeting on July the 10th, you signed a resolution relating to Rural Special Improvement District number 282, declaring it to be the intention of the Board of County Commissioners to assess the district for the cost of maintaining the Lindbergh Lake Bridge and to change the boundaries of the district. Uh, that resolution after you signed it was recorded. It was uh, the clerk and recorder's office mailed it to uh, every property owner subject to assessment in the district. Notice of the hearing today and the fact that there was a resolution signed was published in the Missoulian uh, twice in July, as was the uh, notice of the hearing today at 2 p.m. to come and, and comment uh, on, the, on that resolution. Um, as, a, as a matter of background, the reason that I brought this resolution to you 
Um, some of you may recall, Dave, you'll recall that in 2017, the property owners in RSID 282, some of them petitioned the commissioners to transfer ownership of this bridge to the Lindbergh Lake Homeowners Association. There were two public hearings on that petition and following the second public meeting, uh, the commission unanimously denied that petition to transfer ownership. And in doing so, uh, and in their resolution denying that petition, they, uh, you, you said that uh, the cost of maintaining, preserving, and repairing the bridge shall be paid by the owners of the property in RSID 282 by way of assessments and taxes uh, according to the statutes in Title VII. And you also directed that uh, the Missoula County Public Works Department, through its Chief Public Works Officer, see that this maintenance and uh, needed preservation of the bridge happen. And so that is, that's because of that direction and that resolution in 2018, uh, we brought the resolution to you in July that it was your intention to do this maintenance. Um, in the resolution, there is a statement of the proposed and estimated costs for necessary maintenance. Uh, there's an engineering report that, uh, that talks about the, the probable cost being $66,000. Um, the resolution itself also discusses some costs that the Lindbergh Lake Homeowners Association has incurred in 2014 and 2016 to the tune of $6,067. This is for inspections made to the bridge. And because of those inspections and because of the reports that came out of those inspections, that's where we get the estimate uh, from the engineer of the probable cost of necessary maintenance. And uh, under the RSID statutes, those costs that were incurred by the Homeowners Association in 2014 and 2016 are appropriate incidental costs that can be included in the total assessment that's being proposed by uh, the July resolution. Also included in the, in the July resolution is uh, um, the statutory assessment that Missoula County can um, impose of $500 for the incidental costs of um, the county effort in um, bringing these resolutions and the mailings to residents and then some of the oversight of the, uh, of the project. So the total amount to be assessed as proposed in the resolution is $73,176.29. Um, before I go on to talk about the method of, of, of assessment, I, I do want to just, for the purposes of the record, clarify that this resolution also changed the boundaries of RSID 282. Um, the original uh, RSID was created in the late 70s. Many things have happened um, over the course of 40 years. It was determined that some property that was originally in the RSID does not benefit from the bridge because there are properties on the north side of the bridge and don't, don't need to use the bridge to access their property. Those properties were deleted as proposed in this resolution. And then there are some uh, new properties that have, um, you know, uh, because of divisions of land and other uh, land use um, activity over 40 years, there were additional properties that benefit from the bridge that needed to be added to the district. So uh, that's, a, that's an additional thing that, uh, that this resolution does, and those properties that are being added to the district receive this same notice. Um, the method of assessment is different than the method of assessment that was used in the 1970s. In the 1970s, it's my understanding that um, the, and, and this was an appropriate method of assessment to be used, but it was by a 
square footage. So, so in other words, the entire district in the 70s had a, you know, X square footage. And each property's proportion of square footage to that total uh, determined their level of assessment. That's one of the three appropriate methods of assessment allowed under the statute. Um, and maybe it would be helpful for us to look at the map of the proposed uh, district now and you can see why it was determined that that type of, of an assessment in 2019 didn't seem fair and equitable. Um, you'll see that there are several par parcels that are, are very large. I think one is an entire section. But most of the parcels are very small. They're lakefront. Um, and, uh, and so the method of assessment that was chosen here was that each parcel, each property subject to assessment, pays an equal percentage of the, uh, of the total amount. And that, that, uh, that, so there's 115 parcels in the district. And if my math's correct, each parcel will be paying $636.22. And that, uh, that amount, all right, well, here, so here, here's the map that you can kind of see there. There is one property that's an entire section. There are also maybe a, a dozen or so properties on what would be the east side of the road that are considerably larger than the, than the parcels that, uh, that exist between the road and the lake itself. So, uh, and I guess this was a judgment call on my part. I just felt like an equal assessment was the, was the, uh, was the most appropriate way to go. Um, if property is assessed for these maintenance costs, uh, these will go on property owners' tax bills that they receive in November of 2020. So it wouldn't be going on their tax bills that they receive here uh, later on in, in this November. The, and in consultation with a representative of the Homeowners Association, it was determined that the assessment would be for one tax year rather than multiple tax years. That way, they don't have to bond. There is an addition. There's not an additional interest payment either. Um, so the proposal was to just pay it in one tax year. So um, another thing that was stated in the resolution was the uh, was the opportunity for every property owner to file a written protest and the the written protest needed to be well obviously made in writing and presented to the clerk and treasurer's office by five o'clock on august 20th um, and it also set like i already said it set the hearing date for today and um and then had a publication date in the missoulian and so at this time i think it's appropriate for me to uh let sam scott with the clerk and treasurer's office, give a summary of the protests, the written protests that his office received. Hey, I'm Scott with the clerk and recorder. Um, so as John said, after the passage of the resolution of intention, uh, our office published a notice of hearing in the paper on July 21st and July 28th. On July 12th, before the first publication date, we sent by certified mail a letter, notice of hearing, and a copy of the resolution to each landowner within the proposed district. Landowners had 30 days from the date of the first publication, so July 21st, to submit a written protest to our office against the resolution if they chose. Um, and for the protest to be deemed sufficient to bar the proceedings of the resolution, 50% of the landowners would have had to submit protests. Uh, we used two different methods to count the protests that we received, um, by the first method being by tax parcels, so by these 115, which is now 116 due to a recent subdivision. Um, so by those 116 tax, par tax parcels or by lots or parcels that are conveyable independently. So if somebody had three lots within one tax bill, we counted that both ways so that we would kind of cover all our bases there. Um, the results were that for the 116 tax parcels, we received 45 protests, which is 39%. And for the conveyable parcels of the 129 conveyable parcels, we received 54 protests, which is 42%. Um, statute also requires that all owners of a property sign and submit a protest for it to be considered valid. So those first numbers were assuming that every protest that was received was completely valid, had all of the owners 
of the property that whoever signed on behalf of a business had the right to do so. Um, by removing the protests, which were not signed by all owners, the percentage of protests lowered to 28% for both tax parcels and conveyable parcels. Um, we still hadn't checked for um, proper entities of businesses or trust to sign as that requires a cost and with it only being at 28% we didn't purchase that from the Secretary of State. Uh, so ultimately those numbers did not reach 50%. Thank you, Sam. Anything else, John? Well, so the purpose of today's hearing is, um, and, and I, I don't make this language up, I'm, I'm just reading it from the statute, it is to hear and pass upon all protests so made and then also to take public comment uh, if there is any on the uh, proposal to levy and assess for purposes of maintaining the Lindbergh Lake Bridge. I did prepare a, um, I, I, I didn't do it on the RCA, but I did prepare a proposed um, motion for you. If you find that there is, uh, that, that you, that you want to go forward with the levy and assessment and that there is insufficient protest to, um, uh, to do so. Thank you. And just so everyone in the audience is clear, uh, the potential motion that we would be making today, and I'll just read it so everyone knows what it is that we're here to comment on today, is that uh, it would be uh, the Board of County Commissioners moving that there is insufficient protest to Resolution 2019-106 and we would also direct staff to prepare a resolution for levy and assessment of tax as provided in uh, Montana code annotated. So this is a public hearing. I would invite uh, folks to come up and uh, speak if they would so choose. Remember, please state your name. Uh, try to be succinct, keep your comments to three minutes or less. Uh, one turn at the microphone and there's always the potential that a commissioner might uh, ask you a probing question after the fact. So. Come on up if you so choose. Oh, come on. Here we go. All right, and I'll kick this thing off. My name is Bill Junkmeyer. I'm a lifetime resident at Lindbergh Lake. I had a place there since uh, yay high. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, Could you bring the microphone a little closer? Sure. Sorry. Uh, Bill Junkmeyer, Lindbergh Lake. Uh, I've uh, been at Lindbergh Lake uh, for most of my life, all my life. And uh, I've presented before the commission previously, so thank you very much for this hearing. Number one, right off the bat, uh, the Lindbergh Lake homeowners, uh, we support the maintenance on the bridge. Uh, very much in favor of that. The bridge is 41 years old uh, and has not had uh, substantial maintenance uh, in its history. You know, a little bit uh, of history on this is the homeowners, uh, created a rural uh, special improvement district uh, 282 41 years ago and they signed a petition process to establish that that uh, uh, improvement district but nowhere on the petition or nowhere during that initial discussion was there a discussion that the private bridge that was existing at that point in time was going to become a public bridge and that uh, and there was no discussion of it because it was assumed it would re its private uh, status after the bonds were paid for for the rural improvement district you know and over the years uh, numerous county officials have said yes it's a private bridge and even at one point the county had expunged the bridge uh, from their records uh, because they said it was a private bridge but uh, so that's gone back and forth over the years and with the aging of that bridge it's become more and more critical that we establish the ownership of the bridge in order to get going on the maintenance so absolutely uh, we support the maintenance on that bridge. Otherwise, we'll be here talking about replacing a bridge and not maintaining a bridge. You know, uh, the uh, petition process that we went through and we had the public hearings, uh, we had more than a few members of the RSID sign that. There were 73% of the RSID that signed, the, uh, signed that petition, urging that the bridge would be reverted back to a uh, reverted to a private ownership and that the homeowners association there who has paid for all the maintenance cost over the past 41 years we've been billed directly by the county and we've paid paid for those uh, maintenance costs uh, you know we had the public hearing 
uh, but the public hearing was kind of pre-decided before we had the public hearing. And uh, uh, so the uh, question whether it was a true public hearing. But we are here, uh, and we need to get maintenance done on this bridge. Uh, no maintenance has been done. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a period of time that there was no inspections being done with the bridge. In, in the July hearing, uh, we spoke uh, at that July hearing in favor of the maintenance being proposed for this bridge. It's necessary. Uh, uh, the bridge deck was last inspected by the Homeowners Association in 2015. There has been no bridge deck inspection since that period of time. Uh, and that's one of the expenses that John mentioned that uh, Homeowners Association is seeking reimbursement for. Uh, but we have a sense of urgency. You know, but also during that hearing, we, we talked about the need to assure the private road status. This is a public bridge, or as the county says now, it's a public bridge dead ending into a private road. And so we had uh, brought up during that public hearing the need to preserve the status of the private road uh, for the homeowners. It's been a private road all these years. You know, in talking with uh, uh, with Mr. Hart, he um, said, well, it's not really germane to this conversation, uh, not relevant because we're talking about the RSID and the roads not part of the RSID. That, am I paraphrasing you correctly, John? Okay. You know, but, uh, but where it's related is- And, and you at about four minutes, Mr. Jankemeyer. I will wrap it up in Thank about you. 30 seconds. Thank okay. you. Um, in 2005, uh, there was a proposed subdivision at Lindbergh Lake. And uh, with the proposed subdivision, the planning board, the Missoula County Planning Board, opposed the proposed subdivision. <coughs> but the county commissioners, and primarily one county commissioner, was in favor of the proposed subdivision. and. Uh, it was key whether the road and the bridge were considered private or public. During that process, people were going to great lengths to declare the road a public road. And the homeowners association ended up, or the homeowners at Lindbergh Lake, ended up spending uh, approximately $250,000 in order to defend the status of that road as private, in order to defeat the proposed subdivision. You know, and that's the door that we open by having a public bridge dead ending into a private road. And that's the uh, door we would like to close. But um, so, you know, you know, I'd ask the commissioners to empathize with the homeowners at Lindbergh Lake in the fact that they had a private bridge, were told that the bridge would remain private then it becomes public. And then you have the homeowners who had to spend $250,000 defending the status of their road as private. And we're here talking about a public bridge. So, um, you know, we had 73% of the RSID members sign the petition uh, urging the bridge to remain private. And we would like to get this resolved, but we'd like to get it resolved in a private status. Thank you. Sir. Additional public comment. Uh, sure. Question first. So is it for Mr. Junkemeyer? And any, anybody who knows about it can answer the question. So he said 73% of the folks signed the petition. Correct. And that was a petition to expand the RSID and approve this new method of assessment. No, that was to, to encourage the Missoula County Commissioners to transfer ownership of the bridge to the Lindbergh Lake Homeowners Association. And this was in 2006? This was 2017 and 18. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The Homeowners Association, we had had many discussions with the county commissioners in regards and the Public Works Department as far as getting maintenance to the bridge. We made no progress. So because of no progress, we went to the Montana State Legislature and amended the RSID statutes so that we could present a petition to the county commissioners 
urging them to transfer ownership of an RSID property to private ownership. And that's where the 73% came into play. Okay. But the, the issue before us today is about something different. We're, we're looking at whether this RSID should, district should be expanded and money set aside for doing this maintenance over the course of one year. That is correct. We are not that deciding the okay. public or versus private phase of the sure bridge. We're on the same page. So. They are, but they're all interrelated in the fact of public bridge dead ending into a private road and the desire to uh, assure the status of the private road going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm Clark Taylor, Vice President of the Homeowners. Um, th this is a complex issue, and the hearing in November of 2017 establishing essentially public ownership of the bridge is what we oppose, and approving this new RSID to repair the bridge is good and appropriate, but it opens the door to many, many other problems. This yellow area you see is a grizzly linkage zone, and we've gone to a great deal of effort to limit subdivision and development in this uh, ecologically sensitive area. W the legal theory to support the subdivision, Tiamont, that was proposed in the early 2000s, mid-2000s, was a public access to that. The only way we had to prevent it, because 25A needs to be updated as well, that special zoning district that governs the density of subdivision currently allowed, was to protect our private bridge and road and uh, had, a, had an overburdening issue. So they sold the property, everything disappeared. Mr. Cruz bought the property, it went away and we never resolved the ownership. The public record is replete going back 50 years that the county's intention was for private ownership and we took care of it and stewarded the bridge as if it were privately owned. The private road, same thing. Um, I guess I would ask that you reconsider, um, leave things as our status quo. We will repair the bridge. We were prepared to do so before this came up um, so that we can allow the appropriate judicial authority perhaps to determine ownership of the bridge because this opens up the argument. And when I was here in July, I made it very clear I would not oppose public ownership of the bridge as long as there was language in the statute conferring um, that this does not confer public status to the road. Um, that's not a legally binding statement, but it does give us foundation to continue to operate uh, in the manner that we have in the past. And I, I guess the question is, I don't know why the county wants to add a bridge to their inventory. Um, you're spending your valuable time here today by doing so. It's probably not going to go away. There are going to be other issues that are raised because of this and the fact that it abuts on a private road. And without going into all the historical uh, facts, um, I would ask that you leave everything the way it is. And you're allowed to do a six-month delay. Allow us to repair our bridge. And uh, we can argue this before a judge if need be. The other, one more quick issue, the Jocko Trail was raised inappropriately with testimony in November of 2017. It should never have been allowed. Members of the Pro tribe and their attorney, Thompson Smith, were here. I spoke to the attorney immediately afterwards, and they were, they did not understand the issue with the Jocko Trail. They were led to believe by those parties that brought them here that we were denying access of the tribe to a, an historic branch of that trail that's on public land. There is no public land served by this road. It's all private. The Jocko Trailhead that exists within the homeowners exists by means of a private walking easement that can be taken away at any time by the owners of those parcels. Um, so the Jocko Trail re really wasn't an issue. They were here to protest based upon the fact they were led to believe that we were denying access to public lands that held uh, traditional trails that were very important to them. Um, so I, I think we need to clarify that. That should not have been allowed into the record in that November hearing. Uh, and I will reiterate what Mr. Junkemeyer said, that one particular commissioner, commissioner is conflicted to a significant degree and um, should have uh, been recused from those discussions, not only with the Tiamont litigation, but with the hearing in November 2017. 
So um, I'm here to answer any questions. I'm very familiar with the entire legal record pertaining to this, and things are functioning fine. Uh, the, you know, the Swan Valley Comprehensive Plan recommends one dwelling per 40 acres. We do our best to try to preserve that in these critical linkage zones. They have a comprehensive plan that's filed with the county that's not legally binding, but hopefully you take it into consideration as you're considering uh, issues such as we have before us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add, there, there was certainly voluminous and extensive uh, public testimony and uh, deliberations and, uh, and uh, comment back in 2017 and 18 when we uh, discussed the status of the bridge. Come on up to the microphone. Sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I, I thought I heard a couple of different things around the maintenance on the bridge. On the one hand, and please correct me if I got this wrong, because I got the other thing wrong too. So uh, I thought I heard you all saying, well, the homeowners have been doing the maintenance on the bridge and billing the county, and they basically have been taking care of the bridge. It's been their bridge. And then I also heard you say, 41 years old, the bridge needs maintenance, it totally needs to be fixed, hasn't been maintained. And it seems like those two assertions are kind of counter to one another. Uh, to Mr. Date, Junkemeyer. Uh, to date, it's been minor repairs that have been to the bridge, like we had a tree fall over the bridge and took out some guardrails. The homeowners paid for those uh, replacement of the guardrails. Uh, there have been um, minor maintenance conducted by the county, uh, but the county then billed the Lindbergh Lake Homeowners Association for those charges. And uh, the, instead of the RSID, they billed the Homeowners Association and uh, they, they paid for that. So it's been a, it's been a public-private partnership over the years. Thank you. Sir, if you could please state your name. Yes, my name is Steve Page. I'm a home, homeowner also on Limburg Lake and have been a resident for as many years as Bill Junkemeyer. And uh, I'm an owner of lots 42 and 43, and I'm really here just to ask that we, if there's any consideration to extend the uh, the protests of resolution so because my understanding is we've gotten enough votes after the deadline and I tell you why it's because most of us are up there just for the summer and we're there to have fun and spend time with our families and everything my my notification was sent to my home in Spokane so I never got it and I didn't find out about it until I happened to be fishing with Clark Taylor on the 21st and he reminded me have you sent in your protest? And I hadn't. So I have it here, and I would like like it to be included, and, and it should be. I, I'm really asking that we can extend that till the end of September and get the rest of the votes in. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Additional public comment. Mr. Ainsworth, it looks like you're... And we could bring the microphone to you if that would be useful. Okay. That's all right. Take your time. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Dick Ainsworth. Obviously, I have on my Lindbergh Lake hat today. I'm here representing uh, my wife, Linda Smith Ainsworth, and her sister, Marcia Smith Erickson, and her brother-in-law, Donald Erickson. They inherited lots 32 and 33 from their mother when she passed away a few years ago. Uh, her mother and father had acquired that property in the mid 50s and built a home on it, and it's still in the family. Uh, I would echo what these other folks said. I've not been involved in this a lot over the years. Uh, my wife's mother was fairly active up there. Um, another little side issue that I'd like to bring up, and, I may, and, and we've submitted a petition, uh, both that my wife signed and that her sister signed and her brother-in-law signed, and I think those were all in by the deadline. Um, I'm concerned, and it may not be something we can take care of now, about the, I, I think the way the petition, the assessment of the petition is, is not fair in that there's some lots, including ours, uh, they own two lots, um, a total of about 22,000 square feet. 
There's one cabin on them, could not be another cabin on them. There's not enough room for another cabin. Uh, I th and there's four or five other sets of lots similar to that. If you look at the plat, it's, uh, and I attached an exhibit. There's several lots that were platted and they're pie shaped and they get really tiny. And uh, I think there's another four sets of lots where the people have one cabin on two lots and there's no opportunity for, for an additional cabin. I, I think the assessment should be against buildable lots, not platted lots. Um, I think that's more fair and I don't know if that's something that could be changed at this point in time or not. It would change the assessment. Of course, it would, would cut ours and the other four I mentioned in half and it would add to the other ones some, but not a great deal. Um, somewhere I have that number. I think it adds about $30 a lot to the other lots. And, and instead of 600 or 1200 for two lots, it would be 600 for ours. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. But I would, would echo the concern that the other folks here have mentioned regarding the bridge ownership and maintenance uh, and certainly the private road uh, keeping it a private road makes no sense to have it be a county road um, and, and I was not around or involved when the county decided it should be a county bridge but I don't think that makes a lot of sense either as someone else said I don't know why the county would want to assume another bridge uh, they probably got all they need uh, on their agenda now and of course that was uh, done maybe Dave was here but the other two commissioners were not uh, and of course the public works director was Greg Robertson and he's gone now and I don't know what Shane Stack thinks about that idea but uh, I guess I'd ask that you might reconsider some of that stuff thank you thank you and believe me there are some bridges whose name I wish would never be uttered again so uh, <clears throat> notwithstanding this one. Um, additional public comment. Thank you, Dick. I, I have a question for uh, John Hart. I, can you answer Mr. Ainsworth's question about the buildable versus and, unbuildable? And hang on just a second. Uh, just before we go on to that, any other public comment? Sorry. It's okay. All right. I'll close the public hearing and we'll move into questions from the commission. Go ahead, John. So this, the RSID statute doesn't talk in terms of buildable lots versus non-buildable lots. Um, it uses the phrase um, lots, tracks, or parcels, and those terms aren't even defined. So what I did working with, with Sam's office is try to figure out, you know, how to make this fair. And frankly, we we don't have the capacity to... Uh, analyze each and every lot to determine whether or not it's buildable or not. It just seemed like, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to deny that that there might be some inequity here, but the capacity that we have and the the latitude that we have within the statute doesn't allow us to dive down that deep. Thanks. Other questions? Josh. I'm just concerned we're kind of blurring things here and that maybe uh, these gentlemen brought forth compelling <coughs> testimony, but it was about the ownership of the bridge and our discussion today is about the RSID on the bridge. And I would be more inclined to keep our conversation and, and resolution votes on the bridge. No, no, not at all. I thought that was a really good question and, and it was a good answer and I feel better now that I understand it a little better. So, uh, But that we consider this RID at our RSID issue, and then maybe at a later date have a conversation about long-term ownership. But in the in the short term, I'm moved to towards getting this done so that the maintenance will get done and no one will be injured and the bridge won't fall in, and that at a later date we have another conversation about ownership. I'm concerned that if we don't do this and put this off that uh, something the bridge will break something bad will happen your all's efforts may be thwarted one way or another in terms of getting the maintenance done and this is a way to take care of the bridge in the short term and then we could have this larger discussion at a later date well certainly the bridge maintenance needs are very real and um, 
and I would encourage uh, the other commissioners, if you haven't had a chance to do so already, to review the public record prior to this time as it relates to the disposition of the bridge and the requests of the homeowners association because uh, it's uh, probably not appropriate that we get into the weeds on that today and and certainly we don't have time it's it, it is voluminous um, but I, I concur it's important to to not blur the issues at this juncture um, question I have for you John one thing that we heard from folks out here was the notion of incorporating language into the resolution as to the current status of the bridge or not the bridge but the road on the other side of the bridge what are your thoughts on the merits or or uh, disadvantages or imprudence of doing that commissioners it's my opinion um you know and and, and mr junkmeyer did uh, did paraphrase or characterize my my uh conversation with him accurately I don't think that the status of the road on the south side of the bridge is uh, is an issue that's relevant for purposes of determining d does the bridge need to be maintained and how will that maintenance be paid for. There, there isn't any requirement in the RSID statute uh, when creating a, a, a bridge RSID to make some determination about the status of the roads leading up to the bridge, um, especially when the road on the north side of the bridge is clearly a county road and is established as such and recognized to be a public right of way by all. Um, I'd also want to say that, look, there, there, the, the, the proper place to consider one avenue um, uh, venue to consider the status of the road would be if there was somebody brought a petition to the commissioner and said we want uh, south let's call it south Lindbergh lake road established as a county road that would be the time for the status of that road to be determined and as part of considering whether or not you would want to establish that as a public road, you'd have to consider um, the damages that you would have to pay to the landowners um, whose land abuts that road. And, you know, I, I just, I, I sit back and I think there isn't enough money in the county road fund to pay for um, the damages or pay for the, the cost of that public right of way. So that petition, um, at least in 2019, would be dead on arrival, in my opinion. I mean, I, I, I'm not on the ballot every, every six years. But, uh, and I'll also say that, uh, and I have reviewed an extensive road portfolio that Steve Nyday has prepared uh, regarding the status of South Lindbergh Lake Road. That portfolio has been shared with representatives of the Lindbergh Lake Homeowners Association. All of the evidence in that portfolio leads to one conclusion, that the road on the, uh, the South Lindbergh Lake Road is a private road. In fact, it was a county road decades ago and it was abandoned. And, um, and uh, you know, like I said, that's been provided to the Homeowners Association. I, I did not work for the county during the time of the Tiamont subdivision. Uh, imbroglio, and I was not involved in the way that that lawsuit was resolved, but I've reviewed that, and I do see where there was an intent at some point in time in resolving that lawsuit to get some sort of a declaration that South Lindbergh Lake Road is private. That didn't happen. I don't know why it didn't happen, but the case got settled without it happening, and it isn't something that, in my opinion, needs to happen today in 2019. Um, I also, and Commissioner Strohmeyer can appreciate this because he was at the hearings that we had um, on, on the petition to transfer ownership. We heard from the United States Forest Service and we heard from representatives from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Both of those uh, entities believe that there is a non-motorized public prescriptive right-of-way across the bridge and on South Lindbergh Lake Road to access the Jocko Trail. I mean, with all due respect to Dr. Taylor, you know, there's, there's obviously a difference in opinion about that, but there, 
Th both of those entities were on the record that there is some kind of a right-of-way that they feel the, the federal government has and that through tribes and their, their treaty have to cross that bridge by foot and access the Jocko Trail. And so I, th I think, uh, and again, this is just my own opinion, I think it would be inappropriate for Missoula County to try to speak uh, for those entities uh, because they have their own opinions. And so um, just like it was alluded to in some of the public comment today, the proper forum for determining the status of that road is really in district court. And the, the property owners can ask the district court judge here in Missoula County, uh, if they choose, to declare the status of that road. And then, by so doing that, if Missoula County wants to take a position in that, we could do that. If the tribe wants to take a, a position in that, they can do that, as well as the federal government and any other private citizen could take an, a, a, a stand, uh, have, their, have their opinions be, be made known to the judge before he or she makes her decision on that. But in my opinion, that's the proper forum for um, determining the status of that road, not as part of this maintenance RSID or another uh, formal resolution from the Board of County Commissioners. Do you, do you guys Thanks. have any questions about what, I, what I've said there? No, I actually really appreciate the full, the full picture. And uh, I feel like I understand it better and would like to just take care of business on this RSID and encourage the folks to do as our attorney has suggested and move this toward the proper venue to reach your ultimate goal. I, sorry. Nope, go ahead. Um, I just want to uh, borrow a, a Steve Nide question, and I don't mean to prolong this or muddy anything, but Mr. Junkmeyer or, or Taylor or Mr. Page or Ainsworth, um, what do you fear? Would uh, any of you like to address the commissioner? We have no problem with an RSID in the county assessing us and paying for repair of the bridge. We'll do it ourselves if you don't do it. I just would avoid any language that implies ownership of the bridge, either way, if you prefer. But that opens up the door. Uh, you say it's a lot of money for the county to come in and, you know, d declare that road public and pay damages to landowners. Um, there's a lot of money involved when you have a large development interest trying to subdivide and develop an area such as this. The money will appear. It'll happen. It'll be a legal battle for each and every homeowner through whom property, uh, the road flows. So it, I, I just, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Let's get this done, but let's avoid language that confers ownership of the bridge or the road. And I just would clarify one other thing. Even the north end of the bridge is contested as county because there was also an easement through Mr. Carson for them to utilize that north side of the bridge during construction as well. We just didn't contest that during the Tiamont litigation, but the the information is in the public record. It's, it's a big, it, you're right, a judge should determine it, and I would ask that the county not take the step of implying ownership of either the bridge or the road. That's an issue for another jurisdiction, and uh, just use the RSID to assess us and repair the bridge if that's what you would like to do. Thank you. And, and just to be clear, uh, we are not taking action to convey ownership of the bridge to Missoula County. It is the position of Missoula County. It is a county bridge. So, John, did you have, were you chomping at the bit? Well, not chomping at the bit, but what, what, I, what I wanted to clarify is that there is language in, in resolution 2018-024, that's the resolution that you passed in February of 2018, that uh, that resolves that the bridge is is a county bridge. Um, now there is not language in the uh, 
resolution of intention that is before you to, that you signed in July and that we're hearing about today, there is no language in that about ownership of the bridge. And I, I feel that there is not the need to have a statement of about the ownership of the bridge in any additional resolutions that come about in order to levy and assess for purposes of maintenance. So maybe we're, I don't know if we're confusing two or conflating two resolutions, but uh, uh, the resolution today is specific to the RSID and not about who owns the bridge or not. We, we just are concerned with language that a legal authority could come in at a later date and say they obviously declared this a county bridge. Legally, you can't have a county structure about a private parcel. Um, then when it, come, it comes time, for instance, for us to replace the bridge. Then it's a bigger bridge. We have to widen the road. Um, I think we can solve this and both parties stay out of the legal discussion let that be determined on another date by another jurisdiction, but be very careful not to declare it a county bridge. Don't declare it a, a, a private bridge. Um, we're just here utilizing the county as a structure to fund the repairs. Short of that, we were prepared to go ahead and do that ourselves anyway and, you know, assess ourselves. So. Thank you. that clarify it? Well, I, I just want to be very clear that the, the, the RSID resolution is separate from the resolution that Mr. Hart referenced, the earlier resolution that does talk about ownership of the bridge. The resolution that we are uh, having before us today does not. So we're not going to go back two years uh, and amend some resolution that we pri uh, a previous commission adopted just, today. Just think about today. what is likely to happen down the road. The language determined today, referencing that bridge, will come back at some point in a large legal issue because you will have an attorney who will make that as a foundation to declare public access for development. That's Thank you, Mr. Taylor. So I just said, I, I think then if I'm reading into Dr. Taylor's words, the answer to uh, Commissioner Barrow's question is what do you fear? Is you are concerned a uh, development interest? will attempt to develop in a way that you all don't appreciate and you use the, use the logic that this is actually indeed a public road because it's a public bridge, so they should be able to develop and the sort of uh, settlement texture of your area will change dramatically because of it. Is that your concern? Mr. Taylor, why don't you come on up to the mic, please? Let's simplify it even further. We're concerned with the overburdening of each individual property owner's easement that would occur in the light of any significant subdivision and development. That's aside from the environmental, ecological impact in a grizzly linkage zone. But the overburdening, th this road runs very close to private property owners' homes. And uh, the overburdening of the easement, in other words, bringing traffic in that could increase 10, 100, 200x, um, is what we're trying to protect against. I mean, th these issues, you know, it's real easy to make decisions today and deal with this issue, but they have much larger, longer-term implications that go beyond the intent of our discussions today. Um, and it's just a matter of time, the way things go, before this will come back. And let someone else determine it, whether it's public or private. And let's get the bridge repaired. Thank you. Any additional questions? Ready for a comment and a motion. Uh, okay. S sir, did you, you have a quick comment? I have a, just a quick if you want to come to the mic, please. Clarification. This is really a fairly minor point, but I, what I heard, what I heard from uh, And Mr. could you Hart, state your name, please? Stephen Page. So what I heard from Mr. Hart was that what was agreed to previously was that somebody that wants to access the Jocko Trail has to walk from the bridge, from the county bridge to the Jocko Trail? John? I, I believe that's the status. I, I've seen literature that the Forest Service provides on their website, and, and, and that's how you do it. Personally, myself, I, I went up there this summer. I parked where it said you could park on the north side, and a couple of buddies and I, we, we walked in, and then you, you access Trail 34. And that's that, and so we followed the instructions that the Forest Service publishes for access to Trail 34. Um, and, okay. and, and that's, I, I, 
you know, that's information that the Forest Service has available to the public today. I just this summer personally ran into on a random basis two people that wanted to access that trail driving in on the pro private road and parking off, off site. So my uh, concern is, is the county going to provide some kind of way of policing this that people don't, who's going to police the fact that people don't park on the private road that they should park on the county road? And is there going to be a county parking lot to provide for that? Because there's a number of people that access the Jocko Trail. So that's well, and I would well, just like say, that. in theory, it's a private road. It, homeowners could gate the thing. And uh, yeah. um, and I, I and again, I, yeah. I I don't want to gate it. I don't want to go down the the status of the road no. too much farther yeah. here today. I but to one okay. Uh, The Forest Service, and I have a letter um, in my possession, understands they do not have a prescriptive right to walk the road to that private property where the trail is, where it's a private easement. They'd be interested in, in acquiring a walking easement from each individual property owner. Right now, that easement is a permissive easement, not a prescriptive easement. There's a big difference. It's a permissive use of the Jocko Trail, trail number 34, by means of the private owner, two private owners, that hold that easement. Um, you probably saw the signs posted along the trail. He actually reduced the density of those. He's not inclined to continue this public easement if it becomes overburdened, or this private easement, if it becomes overburdened with more traffic. He'll take it away. So, uh, you know, we're allowing permissive use of our private road to get to that private easement for that portion of the Jocko Trail. So I, I think the Forest Service knows they don't have a legal prescriptive easement to that point. Thank you. Okay. I was just going to encourage you all to get with the Forest Service, the tribes, your attorneys, go to district court and get this solved once and for all. And until that happens, <laughs> I would uh, move that there is insufficient protest to resolution 2019-106 and direct staff to prepare a resolution for levy and assessment of tax as provided in MCA 7-12-2158 and 7-12-2159. Thank you. Is there a second? Um, second. Any further discussion or comments on this? Juanita, did you have something you wanted to? No, just a timeline. Like they, okay. this, this can be taken care of. It can be declared. Yes. Yeah, and I would just say, uh, uh, in response to Mr. Ainsworth's comments, I I understand also this is not uh, clearly not a perfectly uh, equitable solution. It it I think I think staff have done their level best to make it as equitable as possible. It's clearly not as straightforward as we would like in determining uh, uh, what um, parcel, which parcels are buildable or not, but I, I think this is an attempt to, uh, to uh, do better than simply a square footage approach, which clearly would be uh, off the equity scales. Uh, I do think that this is a way to uh, um, get this bridge fixed and um, it remains in public ownership. As far as Missoula County is concerned at this point in time, again, I would uh, uh, recommend that folks go back and look at the, uh, the lengthy discussions we had on that topic. But I would agree with uh, Commissioner Slotnick that uh, uh, as far as the, the road portion, which again is outside the scope of what we're talking about today, that maybe a district court's uh, opinion on that would be um, offer some degree of finality. So we've had a motion, second, uh, and discussion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, Aye. Okay, unanimous. Okay, thank you everyone who uh, made the trek to testify on this. Our final, fifth and final public hearing today which I'll open is on a proposed resolution of intent to grant four acres at 2340 Mullen Road for low income housing. 
and we will begin with a uh, staff report by Vicki Zire. Thank you, commissioners. At a public meeting on July 11th, um, the commissioners directed staff to prepare a report containing details and information required for the commissioners to make a decision on whether or not to grant four acres for low income and supportive housing. On August 22nd, 2019, at a public meeting, staff presented their findings to the commissioners. Public comment has been received and is still open. Before you today is a proposed resolution of intent to grant up to four acres at 2340 Mullen Road for low-income housing, supportive housing, and a navigation center. The purpose of the meeting is to take public comment today and then to close the public hearing. Then you would direct staff to finalize the re resolution, which would you would then sign and approve on September 17th. If you hear public comment today that you haven't considered before making your decision, you could direct staff to provide more information on the issues that are raised here today before you make your final decision. I'll briefly go over the resolution um, that's before you. Um, and just so you know, I did send this to several of the entities that are involved in this whole um, program and um, they did make a one suggested change and I've made that to the most recent um, resolution that's before you. So the first two whereases of the resolution state the statutes that say that the county may don donate real property or sell the property at a reduced rate to a corporation for the purpose of constructing a multifamily housing development operated by a corporation for low income housing. The next um, five whereases talk about how the county purchased the property and that there was a bond, that there was an election for a bond, and that currently the detention center is built and the bonds and debt service are paid in full, and there are no long the bond debt payments are no longer on the tax rolls. The next few whereases discuss what Missoula County is committed to achieve the goals outlined in both the Reaching Home and the Missoula County's 10-year plan to end homelessness and the Jail Diversion Master Plan. It also talks about, um, the next one talks about Trinity Apartments, LLLP. At the Mullen site, we'll have a combination of th low threshold and supportive housing options, including 30 supportive housing homes to be occupied by individuals and families earning below 30% of the area median income, as well as 100 homes for individuals and families earning below 70% of the area median income and an on-site navigation center. Um, next, we'll talk about specifically the um, items where the developer must meet some criteria. One of them is that they're required to provide an annual certification that the land continues to be used for the low income housing, the supportive housing and the navigation center. Also, the developer will be required to provide the legal description of the property to be granted for low income and supportive housing. The developer will be required to obtain an approach permits from the Montana Department of Transportation for access to the property off of West Broadway and Mullen Road. And the developer will be required to comply with all architectural and juvenile federal and state standards. If you decide to move forward with the proposed resolution in front of you, um, the, the now bear, the, the therefore be resolved would read as follows. The Missoula County Commissioners hereby agree to give a fee simple determinable ownership to four acres of land located at 2340 Mullen Road to the developer for a combination of low threshold and supportive housing options, including 30 supportive homes, supportive housing homes to be occupied by individuals and families earning below 30% of the area median income, 100 homes will be for individuals and families earning below 70% of the area in median income and an on-site nav navigation center to support residents that will operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Their grant would be subject to revisionary clause should the land be, cease to be used for low-income housing, defined as supportive housing homes, serving, and homes for individuals and families earning below 70% of the area medium income, 30 homes specifically for those experiencing chronic homelessness and navigation center that provides the low threshold high service programs for people experiencing chronic homelessness and people re-entering our community from the criminal justice system. The, land, the grant of the land will require annual certification by the developer or owner that the land continues to be used as stated above. The grant of the land will require developer to comply with all architectural and juvenile federal and state standards. That ends my staff report. Thank you. Anna, do you have anything you want to add right now? Okay, thanks. Okay, this is a continuation of a, uh, maybe I didn't mention earlier, of a earlier public hearing that we opened uh, back in August. So is there any public comment on this item? Come on up. Counselor. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Heidi West. I work for the North Missoula Community Development Corporation and I also represent Ward 1 on the Missoula City Council. Um, I want to formally add the NMCDC's support of the Mullen land donation um, to the public record. And I also just want to add my personal support. Um, the county's land donation of the Mullen Street site would allow something beautiful to happen at not one but two sites in our community. I pass the Cooley Street block almost every day on the west side um, and this is the former site of the Skyview trailer park. It contained 34 homes Sorry. and it was inhabited by people who attended the NMCDC's community dinners and kids who attended the um, our Burn Street Kids Club, but also kids that rode the bus and were classmates of my children. These folks were all giving six months eviction notices. With community support, some of those families found better housing, but some of them did not. Some of them moved into equal or substandard living conditions in comparison to the trailers that they occupied. It was, what happened at the Skyview site was a microcosm of how hard it is to find housing in Missoula that is affordable and how hard it is to find housing that is safe and quality. And for some people, housing options just don't exist in our community. Prior to Homeward's ownership of this parcel, there were a variety of sales and projects that fell apart, including a 9% affordable senior housing project. I didn't comment at the last public hearing in part because there are so many emotions involved in what is happening on this site now. And most of all, I am grateful. Um, I'm grateful for all the community partners that have come together to make something amazing happen at this site. And I'm also hopeful. I'm hopeful that with your support, this project will come full circle. That what will be built here at the Cooley site and at the Mullen site will provide housing for people like those that were displaced out of Skyview. And it will provide housing to many more at-risk individuals and families in our community. So thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Heather McMillan, the Housing Development uh, Director for Homeward. I tough act to follow. I appreciate uh, Councilwoman uh, Heidi's comments. That was uh, heartfelt. Uh, we're here to answer any questions. We appreciate you all opening this up and having a public process, considering the language in your resolution and working with us to make um, this donation uh, work into the metrics of things that we have to do to uh, have a project like this come together. So this donation is very important to us and this community and meets a lot of needs around the the community. So if there are any questions, please ask, but we appreciate your support. Thanks, Heather. Additional comment? No? 
Okay. I will close the public hearing. Are there any questions from the commission? And, and again, um, Vicki, could you uh, remind us um, what action we would take today should we want to see this move forward? So what you will do is direct staff to finalize the proposed resolution. Um, uh, we did not hear any, um, at least in my opinion, you didn't hear any comments that would change our proposed resolution. So I would um, believe, and I'll ask Anna to weigh in if she has any comments, but that you would direct us to prepare the final resolution for adoption on September 17th, which is your next admin meeting. Okay. Anna, does that sound correct? I've never stood here before. <laughs> okay, this is Deputy <laughs> County Attorney Anna Conley. Um, it does. I think just it just occurred to me that one thing I don't know that we put in the draft resolution is the fact that this is necessary in order for the developer to obtain financing for two parcels. Um, so it actually is a lot of bang for its buck, if you will. I'm not sure that we placed that in the draft, and that might be something that we would all we would like to add. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Please add that. <laughs> do we need a motion, or can we just give you a kind of a head nod to finalize the resolution? Well, how should this go? I don't believe you need a motion, but that Anna, do you believe in? We can a do it if you. We, we, it, Come on, it, we want to it's make. It's the sort of thing we, we do. We want to make a we, motion. We can do it. Okay. Go ahead and have a seat, Anna. We'll we'll just make a motion. How about that? <laughs> Could, could, I, could I make a motion? You absolutely Bye. may. Jeez. Oh. <laughs> take all the glory. <laughs> no, no, no. Go for it. I'll rock says it for you. It's on you. you okay. I move to that uh, we direct staff to finalize the proposal, um, the proposed resolution, and prepare the final resolution for September 17th. I'm super excited about this project, and I'm just thrilled that we get to um, participate. I'll second that and second all the sentiment as well. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for everyone who have uh, helped get us to where we are today. This is a big deal for um, uh, Missoula County, and uh, and we can have a second round, uh, an encore round of applause when we pass the final resolution on the uh, 16th, I believe. 17th, excuse me. Numbers of people will just dwindle. It'll buy <laughs> Come on out for the real the deal. Smile. So this is just yeah. a On the 17th, it'll just be us. Yeah. Okay. This would be admin, 10 a.m. on the 17th, correct? Okay. We uh, have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any further business to come before the commission today or final comments by the commissioners? Seeing none, we'll be, oh, yes, this is a rare uh, final comment from the public. Okay. Oh, well, if I jumped up before Carissa. Um, this is related to your first motion, and since Heidi's put in the cards on the table emotionally today, I just want to thank you for uh, your uh, commitment to suicide prevention in Missoula. My oldest goddaughter, uh, 10 years ago lost her father and a dear friend of mine to suicide and she's one of the organizers of the events this week so thank you for your support of that so thank you hi everyone i'm carissa dry and i am i uh, would just love to have on public record recognize that you all can't all attend but this evening the missoula home coalition in partnership with clearwater credit union and imagination brewing company are hosting a thirst for home a fundraiser for the housing coalition that's been a really big part of moving some of the the homes trying to find homes for Missoulians forward and so I'd love to have that in public record and invite everyone to join us from 5 to 8 p.m. Great thank you okay with that uh, we will be adjourned <laughs>